It is an honour to uh, bring the Word tonight. I know this platform has been built and sacrificed for over many uh, decades, so I count it a completely, a complete honour to be standing before you. And you made the right decision to be in church tonight. I really do believe that you can walk in here and maybe your head's down a little bit, but I believe by the end of this night, your head could be lifted towards Him, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So you are not here by accident. Who knows what could happen tonight? Now, I've got some props here and it's going to help me out because the theme that we've been talking about on a Sunday night is how I met Jesus. Can we pray? Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you are here right now in this moment. Father, I pray, God, that you would move, God. Holy Spirit, Lord, even through uh, those joining online in, in Perth, God, Lord, I just believe for your spirit, God, to just fall on this place. Lord, may this not just be a nice thought, but Lord, may it be the Word, God, for people in their lives right now. Father, I thank you, God, that you're moving, you're shifting, you're changing things, God. Lord, I pray that we would walk out of here different to the way that we walked in. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said together, amen, amen. amen. As you grab your seats there in Perth, everywhere, why don't you tap the person next to you and say, you're one of the good ones. You can call this message the cross before the crown. The cross, wow, okay. Ooh. The cross before the crown. Wow, great crowd. This is good. We can work with this. Ava, that was perfect that you um, wrote that song and uh, she brought that song as an offering to God tonight for us. That's exactly what I want to talk to us about. Taking up your cross, laying down your crown, and following Him. You know, I want to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, what it is to be a Jesus follower. You know, I want to start with this scripture in Mark 10. It reads like this. This is the story of the rich, young ruler. And some of you may know this story, but it goes a little something like this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give to false testimony and you shall not defraud honor, and you must honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. I love verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, he used the illustration of children and how to enter the kingdom with being childlike. And then in verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God, all things are possible. Then Peter spoke up and said, we left everything to follow you. We're talking about the time I met Jesus. For me, it's interesting uh, because I don't have one of those testimonies that so much, um, you know, I had a bad past or ended up here and hit a pitfall. For me, I kind of grown up in an atmosphere like this. I grown up with a faith and awareness of God. In fact, I want to kind of take you in a little time capsule. I want to take you on a little bit of a time machine warp we're going to go back and we're going to send a letter back to little Togsy. So I thought I'd write a letter to little Togsy. And the letter I wrote to little Togsy. We're going to talk to Togs because I want to let little Peter Togonavalu know of everything that he's about to face and go through. It's just a little snippet and a glimpse into part of my life. Hey, Peter, how's it going, man? You good? Nice. 
It's a long story, but it's 1996 and you were in the living room of your home as a 10-year-old kid. Frustrated because Elvis, how great thou art, is playing through the, your house for the 12th time on repeat. It's loud because of your half-deaf grandpa, strong in his faith, weak in his age. Although you don't realise it now, this is becoming a strong foundation in your life as your grandparents introduce you to the Word of God. And through their faith, they will teach you how to read your Bible and the value of going to church. But you're a kid and still figuring it out. Your God-fearing mum, week after week, will force you, yes, she did, force you to go to church. Your God-fearing mum, relentless in her pursuit of raising up her children in the house of God will, again, force you to go to church. But just go with it, it will be good for you. You won't want to for a couple of years, more than a couple. <laughs> but in the long run, you'll play a part in building the same place you never wanted to go. If I could tell you what you're doing right now, you wouldn't believe me. But hey, right now, you have an awareness of God and faith and you'll learn so much in the years to come. When you turn 18, you'll have a defining moment one night where you go from having a faith to faith costing you something. A night that marks you. You'll never forget it. It will become a little bit of a theme in your life. Just go with it. You'll be okay. Invited by your friends, 18, the legal age in Sydney, Australia, to do whatever you want, apparently. You'll find yourself at the entrance of an environment you know will lead to a path of destruction in your life. As you're about to step in, you feel the hand of God on your chest, bringing you to complete halt and a whisper, you're not going in here. I've set you apart. This is not who I've called you to be. That night, your friends live their life away, yet you'll spend the next few hours in the middle of the night seeking God. A night where you went from laying down your crowns of peer pressure, comfort and convenience for the sake of carrying your cross and following Jesus. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Why not? You see, following Jesus, for many of us, maybe you've been born into faith. Maybe you have a religious background. But tonight, I'm not talking to you about having an awareness about God. Tonight, I'm talking to you about giving up your life for Him. You see, one thing we read in this Scripture in Mark 10 is that a young man seemed to have a faith. The rich, young ruler, he had it all going for him. He was rich, he was young, and he seemed to have authority in the land. But he came towards Jesus and he fell at Jesus' feet. The Bible says he fell at the feet of Jesus and he said, how do I inherit this life that you're talking about, the kingdom of God? And Jesus asked him some questions and they began this discussion about what it is, salvation, what it is to be saved, what it is to inherit the kingdom of God. And this young man said, I've done all those things. In other words, I've had a faith. But there was one thing the young man was still lacking. Jesus said, the one thing you are lacking is the one thing you need to give up. You see, he still had the crown of wealth on his life, rich, the rich young ruler, and he couldn't give it up. Jesus said, go and lay down that crown. Then come and follow me. The sad thing about this story is this young man couldn't do it. The Bible says he walked away grieved because he couldn't lay down that which had possession of him. Christianity, following Jesus, is this big paradox, isn't it? Two statements contradicting each other, yet perhaps are true. One thing we see in this Scripture in Mark 10 is Jesus is saying, in order to inherit, you must give up. See, the ways of following Jesus is this. If you want to go up, then you must go down. If you wanna be great, then you must become the least and you must serve. For if you want to be first, those who wanna be first, 
become lost. You see, that doesn't fit our society because our society says, you want to be great? Be the loudest in the room. Be the loudest in that that boardroom. Be the loudest. You want to be great? Then get the right amount of followers, put a little tick and verification to it and let everyone know that you're great. You want to be great? Light, post something up that's on your highlight reel. Show everyone that you are living that life. You see, this is the sort of society that we live in. But one thing I learned from Mark 10 and this man with a faith that couldn't give up the crown that was holding him is that it says about Jesus this, that Jesus doesn't want part of our life. He wants all of you. In fact, Jesus is not a supplement to our life. He is not an add-on to our life. Jesus must be everything in our life. You see, I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, but maybe Jesus is a little add-on for you. Maybe He's a supplement that you add on here and there. Can I just say, the Jesus that we serve, the Jesus that we sing about, He gave His all for each and every one of us. And I'm not gonna give Him part of me. I'm gonna give Him everything. It's going to cost me something. It's interesting because in Mark 8, Mark 9 and Mark 10, the the the. The, the, the rapid pace of Jesus' movement from going to village to village, crossing the lake begins to slow down. It begins to slow down so much because Jesus is transitioning now from taking His disciples on a journey towards the cross. He is revealing to them that He's on His way to a suffering, to a death and a resurrection. The, the, the disciples, they were so caught up in the, the crown of who was the greatest that they missed what Jesus was trying to say to them. You read it in Mark 9 verse 33, they came to Capernaum when He was in the house, Jesus. He asked them, what were you arguing about? This is literally after Jesus had revealed that He was headed towards a place of suffering, death and resurrection. And then it goes on that they were arguing about who was the greatest. Aren't you glad that things have changed in the 21st century? Jesus is trying to reveal what He's gonna do in their life and they got caught up in who was the greatest. Again, another time Jesus was revealing what is about to happen. In Mark 9 and 8 and in chapter 10, Jesus was revealing again His crucifixion that is coming and Peter got in the way and said, that isn't happening. Do you know why Peter got in the way? Because Jesus was meant to be this Messiah that had been prophesied for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And He was gonna be the one that would overthrow the government. He was gonna be the one that set up His physical kingdom. He was gonna be the one that rode in on His white horse and liberated Israel and of all her foes. He was gonna be that person. And now you're talking about dying? What do you do when things don't go the way you expected? You see, we see the disciples, they begin to manifest in a way they got caught up in their own crowns. They got caught up in the throne. You see, I've got a throne here. I need, a, I need, a, I need a, an example. Okay, Tyler, you're my guy. You're the easy one. Come up here. Give it up for Tyler. Come and sit on your throne. Come and take your rightful place, Tyler, all right? Tyler, this is, this is, this is, this is stand up for a moment. This is, this is, this is actually borrowed from your wardrobe. So this is your robe, put on your robe. That's your robe that you must hang around you. You see, this is what I think happens in our life because this is the reality. You and I, we are all in relentless pursuit of a crown. Whether you know it or not, we are all in a relentless pursuit of a crown. And this is what begins to happen. The enemy actually taps into this because He knows that you want a crown. We see this begin to happen in Genesis. In Genesis 3, He said, you will be like God. That's what He said to Eve. And He said, you wanna be like God? He tapped into the crown. You want a crown over your life? And this is what happens in our life. Still to this day, take a seat in your throne, in your rightful place, Tyler. How does that feel? How does it make you feel? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> wow, you like authority, you like power, don't you? But you see, <laughs> a little too close to home. My, but <laughs> I'm joking, he's a good guy. You see, what the enemy does is he puts the crown on us, the crown of comfort, the crown of comparison, the crown 
of ourselves. And he says, you know what? That crown looks really good on you. In fact, you should send that email. You should send that email and let everyone know what you think because that crown of yourself and your desires really matters. In fact, Tyler, you know what? I don't know how you hang around here, man, and keep giving everything. Why would you give up? Why would you give up everything to serve people? In fact, you should just chill and put on the crown of comfort because it looks good on you. You know what, Tyler? People are doing better than you all around the globe. Yeah, there's people, if you look through your social media long enough, everyone's in Europe right now and they're holidaying it up. <laughs> You're here right now. You know what? If you compare long enough and look at people's lives long enough, Tyler, listen, you just need to put that crown of comparison on your life because it looks really good on you. We begin to put this crown on our life because we're all in pursuit of a crown. We're all in pursuit of wanting to be somebody. We're all in pursuit of letting everyone know what we think. We're all in this pursuit of maybe for you, maybe it's climbing that corporate ladder and getting the fine office in the corner somewhere. Maybe for you it's something, maybe it's crown of comfort or maybe it's something where it's the crown of convenience, but I don't know what it is for your life. The crown was not meant for us. The crown was never designed for you. It was never designed for me. The crown was always designed for one person, Him. His name is Jesus. You see, the crown was always for Him. And what we have done is we've taken what is not ours. Can I just say this? The crown does not fit you or me. It was His. You see, I love the picture it gives us in Revelation, how it talked about wherever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him, who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns and they follow Him or they lay down their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, our Lord God receive glory and honour and power. The crown wasn't meant for you. It was meant not for me. It was meant for Him. Here's my question for you. What crowns do you need to lay down? What crown are you wearing? What are the crowns that you need to bring to the foot of the cross? You see, I want to transition now. Thank you, Tyler. Give it up for Tyler right here. But I want to talk about this cross. You see, in Mark 8, Jesus is talking to the disciples who, mind you, are still getting caught up in their crown of comfort. Wait, wait, wait. No, you were meant to be the one that was going to rescue us. You were the promised one. And Jesus now is transitioning towards, moving towards suffering, death and resurrection. And He begins to talk about taking up your cross. In fact, He said this, He then began to teach them and that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed. And after three days, He'll rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him. But when Jesus turned and looked at His disciples, He rebukes Peter, get behind me, Satan. He goes on, He pulls the crowd together. And then in verse 34, look at this. He says, Then He called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and He said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You see, this would have been shocking that Jesus was talking about a cross that we should take up historically. You see, you and I, we live on this side of eternity. We tattoo the cross. We got a cross uh, on the shirt. We got a cross on the back of our car, you know, whilst we're over the speed limit. We are, are got the cross we, 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 we got crosses around our, on our necklace, around our neck. And see, it's cute on this side of eternity, but when Jesus was talking about the cross, He wasn't talking about something beautiful. For them, they would have heard Him talking about the cross. You may as well have been talking about an execution chair. Because historically, that cross, perfected by the Romans for hundreds of years, it was actually a way of setting an example. You mess with us. And this is what's going to be ha happen to you. It was a slow death. It would be a death that would go from between four days or six hours to, to four days. 
crucifixion was for the worst of criminals. It was for foreigners. It wasn't for Roman citizens. In fact, this was for people who were the worst of the worst. So when Jesus was talking about taking up your cross, they were thinking about the cross where people were beaten, scourged, maimed. They were thinking, wait, wait, you're talking about the cross, the brutal cross where people were publicly shamed and hung naked. People were beaten, seven inch nails would go into their their wrist and into their feet. In fact, there was one description I read where the knees would be cracked and broken in order that they would die by suffocation. And the only way to hold yourself up on that cross was to gasp of air. And it wasn't the death or the wounds that would kill you. It was just slow death by suffocation. When they heard the cross, Jesus talking about carrying the cross. Can you imagine what they would have been thinking? Hold up. What you talking about? That, that, that cross that you're talking about, that's going to look a little bit inconvenient, Jesus. That cross you're talking about, that's going to look a little bit uncomfortable, Jesus. Imagine if we actually walked around with a cross on our back here in the 21st century. Can you imagine? We would look ridiculous. Just to go with me, humour me for a moment. But imagine we started to walk around Perth online in whatever community you're from and you began to wear your cross. Can I just say, people would probably start to notice your cross. The challenge is for many of us believers, and I'm gonna challenge some people right now, uh, we, we cannot see the cross that you're carrying because your life looks nothing different to that of the society and the culture that you and I belong to. You see, the culture needs to understand there's a cross that we're carrying. That night when I turned 18, I walked into a place that possibly would have noticed my cross. You see, sometimes the cross, it's gonna be a little uncomfortable on your back because the ways of following Jesus, it is not comfortable, nor is it convenient. In fact, when Jesus was talking about, uh, you know, blessed are these peacemakers and blessed in Matthew 5, He may as well have called that passage, Jesus' word, the most inconvenient thing ever. Because He's talking about forgiving people. He's talking about, Loving your enemies? What's He talking about? He's talking about carrying your cross. He's talking about, yeah, I know it's gonna cost you something. I know it's gonna, you know, be a distraction for society who see this. Imagine if I walked into some spaces with this cross, people would notice what's on my back. People are gonna be like, what are you doing with that cross? Sometimes this cross is gonna look like conviction. When everyone else is compromising, a cross sometimes is gonna look like conviction over your life. You see, cross, when you are living by the cross and when you are carrying the cross in your life, it is not lived by preference, it is lived by purpose. When you live by the cross, it's a life of discomfort sometimes. You see, that's what I'm talking about. It's a life of discomfort. Sometimes you're gonna feel uncomfortable. You mean I I gotta go to church this Sunday? You mean I gotta go to two services? You mean I gotta be in connect group to be planted in a community? You see, sometimes our lives, we look for convenience and comfort, but there is nothing convenient and comfortable about carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. And I wanna encourage you, Live your life in a way that carries the cross. Now, I'm not talking about, woe is me. This is my burden to bear. I'm nothing but a worm. Woe is me. This is my cross. Yeah, this is just my lot in life. And this is just what I've got to carry. And there's nothing joyful about my life. No, 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 no. When you understand the true power of the cross, when you understand what happened at that cross, the power of salvation for the Apostle Paul, he talks about it. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But for those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God in our lives. And can I just say, when you carry this cross around, We're not, we're on this side of eternity. We're not just carrying around something of a crucifix. No, we're carrying around our freedom. We're carrying around our hope. We're carrying around everything He gave up for us. You see, He went to the cross for each and every one of us. He died a sin. He died for each.
each and every one of us and gave up His life so that you may know resurrection life. I love what it says in Revelation 12. It says this, it says, that they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You see, sometimes carrying the cross is gonna look inconvenient and uncomfortable. I was having a discussion with my good friend over here, Mike Gore. He works with the persecuted church and we had a conversation once and something he said really stood out to me about the persecuted church. He was saying in the West, we look at suffering as an absence of God, whereas the persecuted church see it as a drawing near to God. You see, we associate God is good when He provides. We associate God is good when we have safety. We associate God with, when I feel secure, God is good. But my Bible teaches me that God is good all the time in and out of season. God is good all the time. You see, I love that the persecuted church, thinking about the cross that they have to carry where their lives, they wake up every day and wondering if this is gonna be the day or not, they're gonna give up their life for their faith. Yet they understand that it's a nearness to God. When they give up their life, it's a nearing to God. You see, it means when we carry the cross, it's gonna be inconvenient. It means mediocre will not, mediocrity will not rule our life. It means His purpose over my preference. It means conviction over compromise. When we follow Jesus and we give Him everything and we live a life that carries the cross and lays down the crown, it's gonna look like surrender over our life. I'll tell you what surrender looks like. It looks like giving up control. Giving up control, letting go and letting God do what He needs to do in our life. You see, we need to live lives of surrender that says, Jesus, I wanna follow You. I wanna give up my life. You see, I work with young people and many years now, for over a decade, been working with young people and you better not talk about discomfort with young people because I like my life the way it is. You're talking about being inconvenient? <gasps> I can't be inconvenienced. But the truth is this, if you wanna keep following Jesus, He's gonna ask you to do some things that are uncomfortable. He's gonna push you out of the comfort zone because there is no need to trust God when you are in the comfort zone. But when you get pushed out of the comfort zone, you have to trust Him with everything that you've got. The cross before the crown, what is the crown that you need to lay down in your life? The crown is anything that takes your attention away from Jesus. Anything that pulls you away from who He is could be a crown in my life. It could be my own selfishness. It could be my own self-righteousness. It could be my own comfort and convenience. It could be whatever it is. But my question for you is, what is the crown that you need to lay down in your life? Because maybe tonight is the night where you pick up the cross and you lay down the crown that did and does not fit you. You pick up the cross and you follow Him because it's gonna cost you something, the cost of the cross. You see, I'm going to invite Cliff Parse up here and there in Perth, I know we've got someone there special as well, but I've asked Cliff to come and share a little bit and a little glimpse of his testimony. And we're going to jump in a time capsule. We're going to go back in time to a point in Cliff's life as he writes his own letter to his past. Would you welcome Cliff and whoever we have in Perth? Hi Cliff, it's Sunday 2nd January 2011. Happy New Year to you and your family. I'm writing this letter to you regarding the message you just preached on the call of Abraham. 
challenging and encouraging people just keep going when god calls them yeah i hear good news of a growing pastoral ministry for the past 15 years your church family is walking in faith the community respects you and you have an awesome team to help you man i am rejoicing with you but just as you encourage the church to listen to the voice of the holy spirit and keep going where he calls them guess what mate now god wants you to act upon what you preached he wants you to pack up with no backup plan and go from your country your people your household to the land that i will show you i know what you're thinking right now cliff like moses i am not eloquent in speech like solomon you are not as wise like timothy you are too young like gideon why me lord or like nathaniel what good can god do with a guy like me from sri lanka well a few moments ago you were singing i have decided to follow jesus the cross before me the world behind me no turning back was it lip service or did you mean the words you preached and sang today god is calling you to australia a country you dislike traveling to it's going to cost you everything your family your church your friends leaving life as you know it but go with it it will happen in november 2011 later on this year god wants you to share his love with his people who are seeking him but like jonah you will resist and run away from god God will take you to a place called Hillsong, a church you absolutely have no desire to serve. <laughs> God will place you and your family in this church to impact others in places of leadership. God will empower you through his holy spirit like you have never encountered before. God called you to be a shepherd to hundreds but thousands will be the recipients of your servant heart you will think you are a nobody but one day god will raise you again to shepherd his sheep remember no cross no crown as a teenager you surrendered your life to jesus on the 10th of november 1989 and prayed take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee you have not looked back since then god has chosen you not for your ability but because of your availability like abram you will not comprehend all this now yet god will use your story and your testimony will impact others who to leave their crowns and to take up the cross and follow jesus Cliffy 11 years later Sunday 14th October sorry 14th August 2022 you won't believe what life looks for you right now it's been a roller coaster ride you are still waiting patiently on god you have witnessed others succeed you have cried out to god how long god has made a way count your blessings you are a citizen of australia a church you had no desire to be part of is now a place you call home most of your family work here you have new friends and colleagues you are leading and influencing thousands god has positioned you as a pastor to care for the health of his people 
and the best is yet to come. You are not where you used to be and you are still not where you want to be, but by His grace, He will take you where He needs you to be. Just keep going. God has set you apart and His hand is upon you, blessing your no with His yes. All because you keep choosing to leave the crown down, to take up the cross, to follow Jesus. Come on, let's really give it up for Cliff. The band can come and join me. But I hope you get the heart of what I'm trying to bring expression to. Is that I, it's real easy just to live lives that just kind of just walk out this faith. But I don't know about you, I don't want to live a life that just lives faith and lives aware of, uh, have an awareness of God. But I want to give up my life for Him because He gave it up for you and for me. And I want to encourage you, what does that look like in your life? What does full surrender look like in your life? What does it look like to take up your cross and follow Him? I'll finish with this and the team are just going to bless us. But there was this Rwandan pastor and he gave up his life and uh, he on the night before his death, because he gave up his life for his faith. There were soldiers coming into the village and he somewhat knew that he was nearing his death, giving up his faith. He penned to paper something that is called the, unash the fellowship of the unashamed. Can you imagine this? On the night before his death, he penned these words that I think truly encapsulate everything that we're talking about tonight. He wrote these words, the die has been cast. It's gonna come up on the screens. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, you'll be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense and my future secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colourless dreams and chintzy giving, chintzy giving and dwarf goals. I no, no, no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits or popularity. I now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer and labour by power. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, diluted or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until all know and work until He comes. And when He comes to get His own, He will have no problem recognising me. My colours will be clear. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Can I just say as we draw this to a conclusion, what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is it's gonna cost you something, friend. It's gonna cost you ruling over the mediocrity that tries to take possession over you. And I don't know what throne you've been sitting on, but maybe it's tonight that you need to get off that throne, lay down that crown. Maybe it's the thing that's been ruling your life and taking possession of you. And I'm just wanting to encourage you. It's time to take up your cross and follow Him. You might walk into rooms and parties and environments well, they will say, you can't walk in here with that cross. And you say, well, I'm not coming in there with this cross because it costs me, it costs Him too much. Some people will question you tomorrow when you walk into that cross and there's maybe a conversation going on in that room that you know is toxic to your soul. You know what the cross says? The cross says you don't need to be around that. It's time to deny what you really want and start to walk away from that. Young person, you might walk into a club and you might find yourself at the entrance of a club. And I'll tell you what, people will look at you and they'll say, what is that on your back? You say, 
say, this is my cross. This is my conviction. This is my purpose. This is my mission. I'm denying myself and I'm following Him. You might be upset about something. You might feel like you need to say something. But sometimes it's better to just pray and love your enemies. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, but I'm telling you something uncomfortable. I want you to pray and love your enemies. Following Jesus, it's gonna cost you something. This life we've been called to live is not just this big walk in a flower park. We need to live lives that give up everything. And I'm not saying live a life that is sad and nothing. I'm saying live out this thing which is freedom, which is hope for a humanity, which is saying it cost Him everything. And I'm gonna give Him everything. I want the team just to lead us just in this song as we just reflect and we ponder about what it is in our lives that we need to lay down as we take up the cross and we're gonna draw this towards a conclusion. Thanks team.